Hello and welcome to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. We are going to welcome back one of my dear friends today. Shannon Atkins and Gano is on the Zoom screen with me. You may remember her from several months ago. She was on the show. She is Winchester's newest and only community paramedic. She and Jeremy Lettrell were on the show with me a while back talking about some of the programs that Winchester Fire and Rescue have going on. And then Shannon and I were at a meeting earlier this week and I had an opening. I'm like, you, are you available? Can you come and talk? And she's like, always. Anything for you. You were literally a lifesaver once again, only in this case, it was for the radio show. (laughs) There you go. I didn't think of it like that, but yeah, you can say that. This is such an important program that the city offers. And I think it's one of those things that nobody probably even knew or realized how valuable it was going to be until they put somebody in that position and started really getting a bird's eye view on what the residents of the city need and how varied and life-threatening in some cases these needs are. So it's a really interesting way for the city to connect and help those who live within its boundaries. Absolutely. The position has been active for probably two years now. There was an individual, Rob Schmidt, who was initially the first full-time community resource, community health paramedic, if you will. He really got things going and he had to leave. And the fire chief, current fire chief with Winchester Fire and Rescue Department, he knew I was active with a lot of the nonprofits and he knew my past experience and he knew I was retired as a lieutenant with Frederick County Fire and Rescue. So he knew I had some spare time and he asked if I would help. I am currently on the position at a part-time basis. So I try to put in roughly 20 hours a week, give or take. There's (laughs) There's a <laughs> lot of factors that are involved in the position, and I have to carefully strategize my time and allow it to work on the administrative side of things, as well as reaching out to the community and making the connections of those individuals that have specific needs and connect them with the specific resources that are available in our community. So let's talk about that for a second, because as community paramedic, it's not like you're just riding around town waiting for somebody to fall in the street or have a heart attack and you're going to stop and be an EMT. It's a little more involved than that. What does a typical day non-admin look like for you? Who are you helping and what are you helping them with? We've been able to identify through the years locally, I can tell you from working out in the field over 26 years, I was able to identify, many of my peers were able to identify that there's reasons why certain individuals are calling the 911 system over and over again. Maybe they're not clear of their own emergency. What is an emergency? Something has changed in the progression of their health, their life. Maybe the disease process has worsened. A disability has occurred and they're not familiar with what is available out there. They go to their appointments, maybe not. And what is the reason why they're not making their appointments? Is there a change in transportation that's become an issue? Is it a financial situation that's become an issue? What is that barrier that is now resulted in this change of utilizing the 911 system? It's not as easy as, oh, that's an emergency. Let's dial 911 and let's go to the hospital and get treated. I just recently graduated from the Valley Health Connect program. And a lot of what they took us through on our monthly sessions was behind the scenes things. Jason Craig, who talked a lot about community health, gave an example about a gentleman who was fully functioning in society, had a job, had a house, had a wife, until he didn't. His wife passed. It hit him very, very hard. He stopped going to work. He stopped cooking for himself. He stopped all of the things that we imagine grief will do if it happens to us in our personal lives. But then not working meant he wasn't making his mortgage payment. Not eating healthy meant he suddenly developed a lot of other health issues. And then he was diagnosed, I believe, with Crohn's disease, which is not an easy disorder to live with or manage. So he was, on average, calling 911 or ending up in the emergency room six, seven times a month because he would have a flare-up, and that's how he dealt with it. He didn't know how else 
to deal with it. And then they manage to find out these things and do a lot of what you're doing and get him back on a path to eating better, which then made him feel better, get him situated in some sort of temporary housing, finding him a job. Now he's gainfully employed. He has a roof over his head. He's managing his Crohn's. It's the same similar type of situation that you're dealing with, only it could be anything that's going on in someone's life. Exactly. That is probably one of the better examples that I've heard is that big picture. As EMS providers, we get a snapshot, a quick snapshot of the situation. We don't know what has occurred prior and we don't end up finding out what ends up happening afterwards. This position is allowing field personnel They can see something's off, something's different. The environment, maybe there's some kind of question out there. What's going on? And then if they keep revisiting, we're trained to identify trip hazards or fire hazards, whatever their environment, we can identify whether it's a healthy or unhealthy environment. Having the opportunity of those eyes inside of an individual's living environment is providing an opportunity where those EMS providers that are in the field, they can then refer a client, a patient to me, and I can reassess and I then can collaborate with Valley Health and with their network of people that they communicate with, as well as the client, identifying what the needs may be, but also why. Again, Again, what is that barrier? We live life in this conditioned process, and we have this assumption that everything is just going to be wonderful day in and day out until that incident, right? That moment, whether someone suddenly loses everything they own because they had a fire, they're living paycheck to paycheck. And now what? They've suffered a family member that's passed away. And that grieving process, like you explained, you you withdraw, you become numb, you don't know what to do. You've worked with this person in your life, in your marriage as a partner and shared responsibilities. And now that other half of you is gone. And what do you do? There's a lot of people that rely on family, immediate family, but if you don't have that available, then who do you go to? There's a lot of people who rely on their faith, their churches, the synagogues, their members of their community in that regard to help them through. I'm part of a civic club. And I know that the members there, they rely on each other to help each other out through difficult times. So what about the individual who doesn't have those resources or that kind of relationship or bond with other people in your community? Then you're left alone to try and figure them out on yourself. And I'll tell you what, it is a complex web for myself to navigate through, let alone someone else who has no knowledge, no background to figure out all the processes that are involved with getting the assistance that you may need. And then you factor in all of the preconceived notions that people have or things that they think they know. I had knee surgery and now I can't get in and out of my house. So if I need to go to a doctor's appointment, I'm going to call the squad to come get me and take me because nobody else can get me in and out of my house. And they don't even know that access independence is available to put in a ramp. Blue Ridge Habitat for Humanity can make changes within their house if it's a more permanent disability. They have no idea these things even exist. So they do what they assume they know and don't even know that there are other things out there until you come walking through the front door. You don't know what you don't know. So I've spent a, a lot of my time, the first part of getting into this position, trying to figure out where is that list of information? And there are specific organizations with in our community. United Way is one. They have a handbook, if you will, a catalog that has a number of, and it's categorized by your needs, but a listing of all the different nonprofits or resources that are available to help in whatever topic your subject that you're needing the assistance with. On the city's webpage for Winchester Fire and Rescue, the community resource paramedic, I have hyperlinked to different resources that are available. I know the Laurel Center 
they have a wonderful, on their website, hyperlinked information that will provide you the necessary information. If you're in an abusive situation, you can find those resources as well. So the information is out there. It's just, how do you find it? I'll go so far even saying that there's some pridefulness too of people that may be unwilling to take that step of saying, hey, I need some help. But I'm a believer that you have to get beyond that. And it's important. You're important. And I try to teach individuals the value in learning how to be your own advocate. I'll advocate for anybody that needs the assistance that they need. But I think people out there don't know how to be their own advocate and ask the questions that are necessary to ask and that it's okay to ask. Transporting patients to the hospital and all those years that I had transported patients, letting those individuals know it's okay to question your doctor. It's okay to ask the questions from the nurse. It's not a means of challenging an individual that, that they may have this, I don't know, perceived power or authority or whatever based on their profession, if you will, but that it's okay to ask the questions. You don't know it. You, you need to find out, ask. And the healthcare system is set up in such a way that we're that resource network. We're responsible for knowing that information. So when we come across those individuals that need help, we have the answers or I'll get the answers for you. <laughs> Somehow I'll learn where to find it. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about another part of the population that you serve. And it's a pretty large one, which is our homeless population. In the city of Winchester in particular, but it's spread throughout the Shenandoah Valley in general. I know you're working on a project now where you're putting together essential hygiene kits so that you can get them to the people who need them in our communities. Can we talk a little bit about that in the next segment? Yes, we can. Thank you. We are on the Zoom today with Shannon atkinson Gano. She is Winchester's community paramedic. We're talking about that program and some of the things that she needs from us as a community to help her be more successful in that position. We're going to learn more about that when we come back in just a couple of minutes. Don't let a cringy DJ ruin your wedding day. Celebrate confidently instead with Summit Events Co., the premier entertainment company in the Shenandoah Valley. Summit Events is serving 200 couples a year with five-star reviewed DJs, photo booths, 360 booths, live music, and more. You can celebrate confidently with Ben Savory, Summit Events founder and chief party officer who was just named the Top of Virginia Entrepreneur of the Year. Don't risk your wedding. Book a professional at summiteventsco.com. That's summiteventsco.com and on Instagram at Summit Events Co. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. We are on the Zoom today with Shannon Atkinson Gano. She is Winchester's community paramedic. We talked in the first segment a little bit about what that job entails and the people that she's helping and how she's helping them. When we went to break, Shannon, we had wrapped up talking a lot about some different scenarios that you encounter in a typical day and how you're able to connect people with resources they need that maybe eliminates the need for so many 911 calls, that eliminates eliminates the need or even the, a situation where they could injure themselves and rightfully need to call 911. If you can remove that barrier, then it's checking a box all the way around. You also deal a lot with the homeless population within the city of Winchester. There are a lot of needs there. Sometimes they're not aware of what resources are available. During the winter time, I made it a point to go and visit with Watts. I was frequently visiting just to get familiar with who is out there? What are their needs? What is going on? It's new for me because I was riding in the back of ambulances and I was going to the facilities and picking people up, but I was not staying long enough to have the conversations or to see the process of it all and what is going on at these different shelters. I have to say, I've been impressed with what I have found. I'll go in, leave myself available for any type of questions, health questions, concerns. Sometimes it's just as simple as I got a pain here, I got a pain there, what can I do for it? And I try to find alternative, easy way. For example, using a racquetball, you can't afford going and getting a massage. How about using a racquetball and showing them how to use a racquetball on their pressure point and massage that out on their own? 
or there's a gentleman that needed some eyewear because he's trying to get his life back in order and trying to get a job and wanted to go and take a CDL test. But in order to take the CDL test, he has to see, and he didn't have prescription glasses. So I was able to get a voucher through the Winchester Host Lions Club. We got him a voucher. We got him prescription glasses to wear. So he was able to take his test. The shelter is also inviting the different resources to come in during that time frame of operation. They were open from seven to one. So in that time frame, they had different things that were going on, different activities, as well as resources that were coming in. Valley Health coming in, the transition care manager, she would come in and get them hooked up with their doctor's appointments or get their prescriptions squared away or help with identifying the resources as well. And that's a really big deal. Because they wouldn't know otherwise that those things are available to them. Not all of them have lived their entire lives in Winchester. So they're not going to have that background and that history. And again, they just assume this is how my life is now. That level of acceptance without questioning, or maybe they have in the past and it's led to a dead end. So now they assume there's nothing. I tried that. It didn't work. So now I've done all of the things I can do and they don't know what new things may have happened since the last time that they reached out to get information or to ask for help. And here's, you just mentioned, here's the other thing you ask for help. The individual that they asked may not know. And it was a dead end. And instead of asking again or trying a different route, it's like, well, that didn't work. That's done. Talking about it being in the shelters. I think one thing in particular that stands out most for me in this whole experience, Watts, Winchester Rescue Mission, and then you have Family Promise, is these organizations have gone out of their way to identify the other organizations within our community that can help Mm -hmm. assist them. So it's a share collaboration of resources because nine times out of 10, we're having the same repeat clients. We're all trying to collaborate together with that plan, with that mission to assist in any way possible that we can. Bringing in an insurance agency that's going to help with getting them connected to the insurance that they can have, Medicare, Medicaid, whichever they're eligible for. Having different agencies come in and assist in helping with employment, clothing to help assist in getting them clothed properly for the season, or maybe it's getting the proper clothing for that job interview, the food portion of it. And I'll say even we'll go into the hygiene part of it too, giving them the access to the different resources that might be available and giving the items necessary to live as healthy as possible while being homeless. So tell me about these essential hygiene kits that you're putting together. Who are you working with to do that? What needs to go in them? And can I give you stuff? (laughs) So my supervisor and I, Jeremy Luttrell, recognizing that there's seasonal items that I should stock my vehicle with. So when I do travel around, summertime, have things ready that could help with increased heat index. How can I provide items that would help individuals with that higher heat index? And then, of course, the other side of it is what can I have in my vehicle change of season, wintertime? What can I have stocked in my vehicle when you have the colder elements affecting those clients? From that, then it was seeing what was going on inside the shelters and what items are being offered. I had a gentleman, he's, he shared with me a watch band that was broken and his watch face was flopping back and forth. And I went ahead and I ordered a kit, a repair kit. And he was sweet enough. I said, you want the kit? He says, no, you keep it. I know where I can find you. And (laughs) that way I won't, my items won't get stolen, lost or rusted. I know I can come to you and I'll have that kit available and that's fine. But having a chance to go to the encampments and visiting the different shelters, there's items that individuals are carrying with them or could be carrying with them to be independent and not feel the need of having to rely on someone else in a sense, always asking or just waiting for the shelter to open to brush their teeth or wash themselves. This provides them that opportunity when those shelters are not available or they don't have access, that they can still carry them with them and still have the ability of maintaining that hygiene. And then it was a matter of, I'm involved with my church and wouldn't that be great along the whole Shenandoah Valley, getting Mm -hmm. the churches involved and distributing to the different shelters along the Shenandoah Valley. My job here for Winchester Fire and Rescue, I had to say, okay, that's fine. I can do that. 
and delegate it to somebody else, but I'm working on Winchester Fire and Rescue Department. And I've identified this is something that I would like to have for my vehicle as I'm out in the community and I come across a situation, whether it's distributing to the shelters or it's distributing to an individual that's needing the items. So what I've created was an essential care package request, and this is to create hygiene kits for the homeless. I have it listed elsewhere that's covering Warren County, Hampshire County, Page County, and that's for them to handle their own donations and their own distribution. They handle that. But working with just Winchester, I've reached out to the Winchester Fire and Rescue Department's foundation. They have a nonprofit foundation, and I've been awarded some financials if I don't get certain items donated or I need help with adding to those different items, I have those funds that I can go out and I can purchase. Right now I have a box of, I don't know how many toothbrushes I have, individually wrapped toothbrushes that'll be added to, but I've just started this. I have a Shenandoah University student volunteer that's coming in and he's going to be helping me also with the logistics of all of this. But I am currently asking any local businesses, any civic clubs, any type of organization, high school clubs, colleges, if they want to put on their own program of, hey, we're collecting whatever item and they want to donate them to the Winchester Fire and Rescue Department, I am also working with the interfaith groups where they'll be creating the kits. It's this whole collaboration effort, what I've seen and what I've been experiencing, I've seen the beauty in it all. When this community gets together on any project, they really pull together. You're building relationships. You're making this community a better place. You're showing love, compassion, empathy. And I believe that this is what this community is about. The conversations that I've had with many of the leaders, leaders of the different organizations, I've seen what's in their heart. This is what matters, is the coming together, and especially in society nationally and globally, there's so much chaos. I believe in hope, and this is my way of sharing that. What's on the list? What can I bring you? I'm sold. Tell me what I can buy. <laughs> So summer items, sunscreen, bug spray, any type of analgesic, false teeth cleaning brushes, little flossers that they might be able to carry, lip balm, hand wipes, socks is what I'm hearing from the nonprofits. Socks is one of the top items. Ponytail elastics. And the thing I've heard about the ponytail elastics, they can be used for so many things. Right? If you don't know it, you don't know it. And if you're not thinking on survival, you just don't realize some of the things that you might need. Small plastic combs, small containers of Vaseline, water, of course, reusable utensils, dried fruit, crackers, granola bars, instant cold pack or an instant heat pack even, rain ponchos, plastic bandages, gauze pads, cotton balls or cotton tips, any a number of those different things. And it's not saying that each kit has to be exactly the same. Right. A little something is better than nothing. And I might even add toothpaste. Those little tubes of toothpaste might be handy too. Is so. that list somewhere that people listening today can find it? And then where would they bring them? I'm a location spot for the items to be dropped. If a business or an organization is interested, contact me. If you want to be that person or that location for drop-offs, that would be great. But in the meantime, my office will be a holding spot, I'm sure. And that's at 21 South Kent Street in Winchester, Virginia, Suite 301. It's the Winchester Fire and Rescue Department. List of items, I've placed them on a justserve.org website. The title of the project is called Essential Care Packages, Hygiene Kits for Homeless. Warren County, Hampshire County, Page County, Fort Valley, Berryville, Winchester, Grant County, and Woodstock. I am in contact with Just Serve specialists in all of those other areas that I can defer to them and we can work on the logistics for that. But for the Winchester location, you can contact me. And I also have a Just Serve specialist that's aware of the information as well. And we can make this work. And I'll put so. all those links to all of those places on the show notes page. So people can go to the valleytodaypodcast.com, simply click a link. It'll take them where they need to go, where they can right. see right. all of that information. But I appreciate you not only coming to my rescue last minute to record a radio show, 
but for the work that you do. And I know you don't do it for the pat on the back and you don't do it for the thank yous. This is part of who you are. And I appreciate that about you. So I am grateful that we have people like you in our community that are going out and figuring out this is what we need and this is how we're going to make it work. And then you're moving on to the next thing. It's my passion. I feel like this is my calling and I truly enjoy reaching out, making these relationships, making these connections and collaborating with everyone that's a part of this community from city, local, local government to the nonprofits, to the interfaith, local businesses, media, (laughs) Um, random individuals. (laughs) (laughs) It's just been a fabulous, wonderful journey that I cannot describe. I love it. I love it. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad the fire chief reached out to me. I'm hoping I'm doing justice or doing well for the department, but really I'm doing it for the community. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you for everything that you do. So it's been a wonderful journey working with you as well. So thank you for the opportunity. I will be back tomorrow with a brand new episode of The Valley Today. A few minutes after noon, we are talking with the son of a guest from last year. Many of you may remember Laura Elliott was on the show. She was doing a book signing at Winchester Book Gallery and had a book she had written around Apple Blossom, Dancing Dogs at Apple Blossom, as a matter of fact. And now her son has written his very first book, and it too is about The Blue Ridge, a really, really good book. He's going to talk to us about that tomorrow, a few minutes after noon, so meet me here then.